looking back on your career in the seventies, you were you were in and amongst a team um, with th three black players: yourself, Brendan Batson, and Laurie Cunningham. Known as the Three Degrees, how did that? How did you? What did you make of that label at the time? Well, he came by by accident. Uh, Big Ron labelled us the Three Degrees, and what happened was the original Three Degrees was doing a show in uh, in town, a night out, and somebody wanted to do uh, a photo shoot or some promotion, so they came down here, watched the game, and Big Ron had a throwaway comment: so "We've got our own Three Degrees," and uh, it's stuck ever since. What was it like for you playing at that time? I mean, it's a very different time. In the 70s, so, you know the country was going through a, a lot. You know, the racism was was very there, and, and the examples of that were clear in football. What was it like as a player back then? Well, two factors. Uh, yes, for a young lad coming up from London to play professional football and get paid for it was absolutely brilliant. But at the same time, as you mentioned, uh, the racism from the fans was was abhorred. Uh, for 10 years before that, it was hardly any black players playing. Uh, back in the early 70s, we had uh, uh, Clyde Bess, Eddie Coker, and a few others, the Charles brothers. Uh, Brendan Batson made his debut in 1971 for Arsenal. But we never had a proliferation of black players until really when we came here back in the late 70s. We had to fight our own kind of racism because the coaches and managers felt that black players could handle cold weather and uh, too laid back, uh, didn't have enough bottle. So all that prejudice we had to dispel. And having three players here at West Brom in the, in the late 70s was radical. I mean, I don't think any, any team at that time, even before, had three black players. And I think, um, uh, and it was with Anderson at Forest. So that was a real sea change of mentality to see three black players. And I think, how you think, how do you deal with all that racism? I mean, not just talking one or two people, five to 10,000 people shouting nigger, nigger, you know, throwing bananas on the pitch, I had a bullet through the post. And I think two things happened is what you do for your own emotion, because you are emotive, you made you angry, but we, we chose to channel it into motivation. Uh, channel it and say, right, how can we go and hurt you by putting the ball in the back of the net? working harder, putting the ball back in the net and we're winning the game. But also we had a very good side. I think, you know, if we were going out there uh, playing and losing the games, it would be justification toward the racist charting. But the side we had was very good. I mentioned before, top class players, Tony Brown, uh, Derek Statham, Brian Robson, Ali Robb, John White had a really, really good side. So we used to go to sides, uh, matches and, and win. So uh, it was great that on two aspects, we were playing well and we had a very good side. So I think people went, well, we don't like those black boys, but they're, they're good players and, and what a side. You mentioned the fact that you know, there was the three of you that were playing in the same team and had to go through that. But in a way, did it, was it easier because you, know, you had two other players going through similar, you yeah. could kind of stick together? Yeah, I'm sure it was easier. I mean, I'm sure that other teams, where there was only one player, one black player, uh, there was no solidarity there or people didn't quite understand what you was going through. But having Laurie and Brendan there uh, was, uh, you know, was great support. We could talk about things, uh, we could talk about the different uh, ways we was feeling. And uh, we decided, as I said, to use his motivation to go out there and work hard, play harder, put that ball in the back of the net and um, win the game. But I think one thing you do notice is that all the racism was just confined to the stadium. <clears throat> so I walk in down in Birmingham, in London, anywhere else, we never had any racial abuse. Uh, no one was no one was smashing my car up or intimidating my wife or my family or my kids. So you knew it was confined to the stadium. I think it'd be a totally different thing if they were, you know, smashing up my house or or intimidating my wife or things like that. So uh, so because it was confined to the stadium and we had our tools. To, uh, to engage with it, which was our ability. And so that's how we chose to do it. And I think, um, especially Laurie Cunningham, who played for England and myself, and that, that generation, not just myself, that generation with Justin Fashionu, Garth Crooks, Viv Anderson, uh, Ricky Hill, Luther Blissey, all that generation inspired the second generation, the third generation. What I mean by that is, uh, before that, you never saw black players playing football in the cold and the snow and all that. So in the late 70s, where you see this proliferation of black players, the second generation went, well, if they can do it, I can do it. 
and I think to this day, I think that first generation uh, had a really inspirational kind of context for the second and third and even now. So you look at football now, you look at the amount of black players in the game, 25, 30%, you're judged as who you are as a player, not whether you're black or Chinese or whatever, you're judged as a player, which is a long way from where we were back in the late 70s and early 70s.